Now, if you're just joining us, this is our special coverage of the inter-Korean summit between President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang. And if you are just tuning in, we are also joined in the studio by two experts regarding the matter. James Kim, the research fellow of Asian Institute for Asan Institute for Policy Study, pardon me there, and our foreign affairs correspondent, Lee ji -won, on my left. Now, ji -won, let's start with you. First of all, uh, do remind us of the significance of the main building of the Workers' Party where the summit is being held. Sure, Daniel. First of all, it is the first time that inter-Korean summit held in Pyongyang was not held in Baekwawon, which is a sta state guest house where the former presidents Do Muyeon and Kim Dae-jung uh, Kim Dae-jung stayed uh, during their visit in North Korea. Now, this headquarters is also where Kim Jong-un's office is, and it's also where he met with uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in's special envoys early, uh, t twice this year, and it's also where he met a uh, U.S. press uh, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. So uh, we were expecting that this might be one of the possible summit venues, but um, it, yeah, and we saw today that it has been chosen, and it is the first time that uh, it's uh, uh, that inter-Korean summit was taking place here. Right, uh, another grand gesture from North Korea to uh, convey their genuine uh, devotion to talks right now. Uh, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, the, the main building, of course, is somewhere that's been prohibited to foreigners. It's been a rather uh, secluded area. They did not even allow cameras there at one point. So what, is, uh, what can we take from this uh, gesture from North Korea? Um, we have to understand the context. This is the first Pyongyang summit that Kim Jong-un is hosting of any world leader ever since he's come into power. So this is a time for him to make his mark. Um, and he's chosen to do it in his own way. Um, and it, um, some observers have stated that um, this particular summit was a little different in terms of the welcoming um, at the tarmacs at the airport uh, with Kim Jong-un being there with his wife. Um, that wasn't the case in 2007, but it was the case in 2000 with his father uh, taking on um, President Kim Dae-jung. So this is the first world stage performance for Kim Jong-un at his backyard. And he wants to make his own mark that is unique uh, and that is uniquely Kim Jong-un. Um, and I think he did that by making this grand gesture. Uh, and there were a lot of firsts here, largely because this is the first summit. So there, um, we shouldn't read too far, uh, too much into it, but at the same time, we should also be cognizant of the fact that Kim Jong-un is taking this very seriously. Right, this is a great opportunity for him to let the world know, uh, perhaps for some level of legitimacy of his regime as the world is watching. Uh, the latest from Seoul was this just now, that after the second summit is over, we'll learn the overall results, so don't jump your gun and expect anything out of us just yet. What can we learn uh, by reading into this statement from South Korea? Well, two things. Um, I think that the debriefing uh, by uh, Mr. Lim jong suk um, a day or two ago um, and by all the other officials coming out of the Blue House is that denuclearization is going to be front and center. Um, it, is, it is going to be very important. It is part of the agenda. But um, it is also that um, it, it's, it's not clear whether that issue is going to get resolved here and today. So I think the exact statement was that this is a blank. Uh, as far this question is a blank as far as the how it's going to be resolved at this summit um, so to some extent tempering expectations but at the same time trying to say that blue house is making every good effort to try to move forward um, in a positive way on these issues right emphasizing that we're on it but it's not going to be easy right juan turning back to you again the uh Pekhawan state guest house is a very important venue as well it's no is not a very unfamiliar site to South Koreans and those who have been following previous summits. Could you tell us more about the significance of this venue? Sure. Like I said a while ago, uh, it's where the two uh, South Korean presidents stayed during their visit to North Korea uh, in 2000 and 2007. And it's also where uh, Mike Pompeo, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, stayed in July during his visit in July. And a lot of other uh, high uh, international leaders also came and vi uh, stayed in this state guest house namely the uh, Madeleine Albright, uh, uh, the se State Secretary in 2000, and Japanese Prime Minister Koizumi Junichiro, and that he also held his first North Korea-Japan Jap uh, summit in Baekwawan. And uh, the name Baekwawan comes from 100 Flowers Garden. Uh, it's because uh, there are hundreds of uh, different kinds of flowers planted in front of the buildings there. 
And uh, it's not really open to people either. Uh, it's only open to uh, important figures uh, like world leaders. But uh, yesterday we heard that the, uh, one of the media, uh, some of the media crews that went to North Korea for the live broadcast were uh, welcome to stay at the uh, Baekwawan guest house. And so it was also something very significant at this summit. Another sign of willingness to uh, make drastic changes by the, North, the young North Korean leader there. Uh, now, uh, there's a clear cut difference between uh, the first summit between President Moon and North Korean leader Kim Jong un back in April 27. Back then, it was pandemonium when the first contact was made between the two. Uh, even this time, while they were exchanging uh, cheek to cheek embraces, uh, the express uh, the response has been rather subdued. So, we can tell this is more about the two leaders saying, it's time to get down to business rather than another meet and greet. That too, but the organization leading up to that summit versus this one is very different. Um, if you recall, that happened on the South Korean side where a lot of the control and production and the ordering and, and the logistics for that have gone on from this, from our side, from the ROK side. For this particular summit, it's North Korea taking the leader role, well, the lead role. And, and so it's a little less stage, little less drama, right? Um, there isn't that moment on the bridge to nowhere. I mean, we'll see whether or not we're going to have that. Uh, moment tomorrow, uh, whether we're going to have um, a tree planting um, ceremony uh, or something to, to that effect. Um, it's n uh, we haven't seen those moments here just yet, just as stage in its own way, but in a North Korean way, in a Kim Jong Un style way, right? Um, so this is a very different kind of a summit because North Korea is largely taking the logistical lead on this uh, versus that other summit that we had um, uh, further uh, in, in spring where South Korea largely was producing um, uh, the logistical um, um, underpinnings and the organization for that. So um, it's a different, it's, we're going to see different images here. Um, but another very big difference for this summit is that it's there, are, there are sessions or portions of it that are live broadcast, which wasn't possible before in North Korea. So we're seeing North Korea in the sort of raw, unprocessed, um, and, and some, somewhat uh, naked uh, uh, point of view for, for everybody to see. So clearly Kim Jong-un is very different from his uh, improvisational, impromptu mood he was in while he was uh, coming over to the southern side of the border for the summit. Right. Right. Uh, going back to the welcoming ceremony held at the airport today, uh, Jiwon, it's the, the first time the first lady of North Korea was at the airport greeting a South Korean leader. Uh, well, different from the previous session, at least. And of course, uh, the unification flag was there. Yes. Right. So these are some interesting, uh, significant changes we've noticed. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, the meeting between the uh, two first ladies, uh, uh, the first ladies of the two Koreas, it's the first time that they are meeting in the North. Now, this, uh, th there were former South Korean first ladies that came to the North with their husbands uh, in 2000 and 2007. But back then, uh, then North Korean leader Kim Jong-il uh, never really publicly disclosed his wives. So the meeting between uh, the first wives of the two Koreas never really happened. Uh, which is uh, which makes the uh, the, the schedule, the event uh, between the two first ladies all the more special because they share the commonality of music and uh, they, all, they visited the Pyongyang University of Dance and Music and so we can see how much effort North Korea put in there to really uh, show uh, first lady Kim Jong Suk around North Korea uh, well, in regards to her interest. Right, uh, turning back to you uh, Dr. Kim, uh, the soft diplomacy between the two uh, first ladies, that's something that we can expect to see some major uh, changes in from the previous uh, meetings between the two leaders. Uh, in the initial maiden summit, not much was covered except for the fact that they were there. Yeah, um, so I'm kind of curious uh, as to what we're going to get um, today and tomorrow. Um, as the first lady tours, I think there's a children's hospital visit that she has in, in store. Um, and some of the other visits that um, we've, we've, we're just hearing about now. So it'll be very interesting to see if um, these kinds of interactions lead to a yet another dimension in their inter-Korean relations that go beyond just the two leaders. Um, and we'll have to wait and see how that, how that turns out. Back then, the First Lady EEO had some very uh, heart-wrenching moments when she actually was reunited with her uh, former mentor or teacher. And, uh, that's pretty much unscripted. And, uh, something that really reached deep into the hearts of Koreans watching. Maybe we could see something similar this time 
but in a more brighter and positive tone between the two first ladies. Let's hope for the best. Right. Since in the previous times, uh, the first lady of South Korea was uh, given a, a tour with a special, specific uh, guide. But this time, I think the two first ladies will be spending a lot more time together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Going back to uh, some security matters and, of course, some of the uh, uh, pomp and uh, celebrations that we've had at the uh, airport leading on, what was interesting was the, uh, the motorcade with the uh, sunroof open and the two leaders popping out of that. Uh, usually in the past, this was a, a matter that, was, that would have been debated or discussed very thoroughly between the security uh, chiefs of the two, uh, two Koreas. But this time, it worked out uh, quite smoothly. Uh, yes, in fact, the, uh, the car parade happened before in the, uh, the inter-Korean summit back in 2000 between uh, then South Korean leader, South Korean President Do Mu Hyun and North Korean leader Kim Jong Il. But back then, uh, when North, uh, when South Korean President Do Mu Hyun crossed the, the, uh, the military demarcation line, he was greeted by Kim Young Nam, the nominal head of state, and they got on to the car together, and the two had a car parade uh, to Pyongyang. And so uh, it's, you can actually say that today's car parade was the first time that North Korean leader and South Korean leader had the car parade together in the North. It can be a nightmare for the first uh, uh, security uh, secret servicemen yes. who are arranging uh, yes. the safety matters. For, the, for such instances. And it was quite a contrast from uh, the, the time when North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was leaving the summit venue during the first summit with the, his bodyguards surrounding the limousine and walking together. So this is an interesting change from that. One uh, interesting point about right. that is that uh, normally when there is a state visit, it's the uh, host country that provides all these, uh, it, it's a traditional custom that the host country provides all these security uh, officials, uh, f f security officers and uh, guards. But this time the South Korean president brought his uh, security uh, officers together with him to the north. Right, the primary line would have been the, the South Korean and then the yes. secondary and the tertiary ones would be by the yes. North Korean side or a combined team between the two Koreas. Now, uh, turning back to you, Dr. Kim, uh, the key topics uh, include improving inter-Korean ties, of course, and uh, planning economic cooperation, reducing military hostilities, denuclearization, of course, and uh, mediating talks with U.S. Uh, it's a no-brainer which one would take the biggest portion of the summit, right? Um, well, um, a lot of the discussions leading up to um, uh, President Moon landing at the airport uh, was that denuclearization is going to be the most difficult issue here. Uh, but I wonder uh, whether because it's such a difficult issue that it's going to be tackled head on um, and as much time is going to be devoted um, to this issue. And there are two reasons for that. One, the issue itself is difficult. Um, and two, um, the issue um, is, needs to be hand, uh, tackled w in coordination with the United States. So, right, Professor Kim, we're just getting some uh, fees from North Korea. This is G1. Would you care to explain uh, the significance of this venue? This is the uh, this is the headquarters of the North Korean Workers sure. Party. So this, this is where is the where summit, the was, summit held. was held. Yes, for the first time, and it's where North Korean leader Kim Jong Un's office is. Uh, we've also seen this place a lot, a, a number, a couple of times uh, through the Korean Central News uh, Television. A, a, yes. Right. It's quite uh, vacant at the at this moment because this was probably for a PR shot there, but yes. it will be a lot more lively, and uh, I believe more reporters will be surrounding it once the two leaders are done with their summit and they step out of that venue. Mm -hmm. We are looking forward to hearing more about what has what has uh, progress between the two leaders during their talks. Uh, as we were discussing, uh, Dr. James Kim, uh, denuclearization would be a rather tedious topic to just jump head on. Many are expecting that to be the core topic, but it's not going to be easy. I, I don't think it's going to be easy, and uh, largely because the topic itself is difficult. And secondly, um, as I've said before, that it needs to be handled in coordination with the United States, and that player is not at the table. So um, of the three topics, which is the most likely topic that, is going, that the two, two leaders are going to spend the most time on? Probably on the issue of peace. Um, and confidence-building measures, because that's the only issue 
where the two leaders do not have any constraints um, and where the two leaders can make uh, some measurable progress um, in terms of actual action and outcomes. Um, economic cooperation, obviously without the sanctions being lifted, that issue cannot be uh, tackled head on. So again, the two issues that the Moon administration has made the sort of the central underpinning of the, of the inter-Korean relations, economic cooperation and denuclearization, probably largely going to be an issue that both leaders will say, we have a common understanding on these issues and we'll move forward on them, provided that these other issues get handled by, in coordination with the United States. While, while we're waiting, we have the, this matter uh, on, on reducing military hostilities and tensions, and we can do that by upping uh, the confidence-building measures on the peninsula. We've already seen some moves on, that, uh, uh, on, on these issues, right? So, for instance, on opening of the liaison office uh, in Quezon. So we're going to see more of that, um, and we'll see them in ways that we haven't uh, talked about it before. So we're looking forward to probably tomorrow uh, when the statement comes out, there's going to be some really, really measurable um, outcomes on that front. But on these other fronts, um, I'm somewhat skeptical, but hoping for the best. Right. Uh, we are hoping that they can focus and get some tangible results on achievable goals step by step at this point. Uh, going back to the, pos the, the role of uh, North Korean, uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in playing the mediator, it's a tough job, of course. And uh, just as President Moon and his team may be ready to try and uh, help North Korea and the U.S. Uh, meet halfway. It's possible that North Korea has already prepared ways to respond to uh, such suggestions. Right. Um, North Korea may have um, some um, suggestions about what they could do um, to push ahead on the issue of denuclearization so that the U.S. can make its own compromise on their front. But I think um, North Korea is looking for President Moon to largely advocate on their side uh, for their position, that the U.S. needs to really make some concessions here that will allow them to move forward on denuclearization. So the end of war declaration would be one way to do that. Um, the other, obviously, is to try to get some partial sanctions relief, if it's at all possible, if not complete sanctions relief. Again, whether any of this is possible, we'll have to see, because President Moon, right after this summit, is going to the UN um, General Assembly meeting in New York, uh, where some of these issues, including international sanctions, can be discussed. So um, uh, I think that uh, the timing is really good uh, for President Moon to, when, and also Kim Jong-un to set this up for sanctions relief of some kind. Right, and uh, we're looking at the footage right now coming in. It's, uh, at the, uh, the, the, the Workers' Party headquarters, and it looks like President Moon Jae-in is signing a guest log. Uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un left a, a message that implied that they want to meet again soon, and possibly something similar is being written by President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un uh, posing for photos and constantly exchanging pleasantries, and who knows, these kind of uh, small talks might lead to something more substantial in the long run. And also present at the venue was, uh, I believe that was uh, Kim Yo-jong, right, ji the yes. North North Korea's Deputy Director of Propaganda and Education Department of Workers' Party of Korea, and also the sister yes. of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Right, we'll have more details about what specifically was written by President Moon Jae-in on the log later on. Uh, we, do, we, do, we, do have, we did just get updates that uh, the talks did wrap up at 5.45 p.m. They like to get it done on the dot, apparently. And we'll be receiving some more uh, updates on what may have been discussed and what may have uh, uh, been produced during the first talks. And of course, in Korea, there are a lot of idioms that talk about the first round is just a warm-up, and it takes more than a couple of rounds to get things hammered out and done uh, to produce solid results. Now, as we were discussing just now, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Kim, uh, the, the likely request from uh, North Korea to President Moon Jae-in uh, as, a, as a message to the U.S., what could they possibly be during this session? Well, like I said, um, some kind of concession from the U.S. on the war declaration part too, so that Kim Jong-un can then convince his cadre that they, could, they should press forward on denuclearization in a meaningful way, um, or some partial or complete sanctions relief. There's also some of these other things that um, South Korea can do, um, aside from uh, these 
uh, two things. When, and one is obviously cultural exchanges and more of them. Um, some kind of um, um, community-based social exchanges, uh, separated families, um, um, more get-togethers among separated families. Um, and also um, other kinds of uh, confidence building measures that don't go over um, the international sanctions and so that South Korea and North Korea is now violating um, the sanctions regime. So um, we'll have to wait and see how this all pans out tomorrow, um, but uh, I figure that the, there, there are lots to talk about. Part of the reason why um, there are two sessions set aside uh, for the two leaders uh, today and tomorrow uh, for really in-depth discussion on these matters. Right. Originally, uh, usually in the past, there were one uh, summit sessions between the leaders, even if it's a three-day event. Uh, how do you perceive this positive turnaround? Do you expect more summits being held than the initially planned two sessions? Uh, well, we would. It'd be really nice if we had more, but for now, all we know is that there are two. Uh, there are going to be two rounds of summit. Uh, two rounds of talks between the two leaders and as you can see on the footage right now the uh, business representatives of South Korea are currently meeting uh, I mean on the footage are meeting Ri Yong-nam the vice premier of North Korea's cabinet who is in charge of North Korea's economy now uh, to tell you more about these uh, business representatives from South Korea there are a total of 17 of them making one-third of President Moon Jae-in's special entourage, and they include uh, Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong, uh, Hyundai Motor Company Vice Chairman Kim Yong-hwan, SK Hynix Chairman Chae Tae-won, and LG Corporation Chairman Koo Kwang-mo. And uh, it's alleged that uh, a lot of South Korean media uh, reported that North Korea had wanted these business people come at this summit uh, because it is. Uh, they wanted people who have direct authority on uh, in investment in North Korea. But a while ago, press secretary, uh, the top office press secretary, Yoon Young Chan, said that that report is not true and that these business leaders were picked by the South Korean government. Right. What was interesting there, uh, Dr. Kim, was that uh, the the list of the who's who, the big names of South Korea's uh, business realm, they were uh, they were unveiled rather last minute. Mm. This was not the case in the past because they, they will be the top headliners, right? Right, and I think um, there might have been some um, caution on the part of uh, the Moon administration about who would be a good candidate uh, for going to this, uh, to this visit. And also, maybe some of the business leaders uh, were a little reluctant, possibly, um, about a potential visit, given how it may look um, to... Um, you know, a lot of the U.S. regulators, um, a lot of these companies um, and the, the, the business leaders that have accompanied President Moon on this trip have businesses and interests um, in the United States um, and in Europe. Uh, they're multinational corporations. So um, I think there were some worries there about how this would reflect on the, not only regulators but also on investors. Um, and also some concern about uh, what would be asked of them if they went on this visit. But um, ultimately, at the end of the day, who's who is all there. Um, the major companies are all represented at this, uh, at this visit. So it's, uh, at this point, it's a symbolic gesture of uh, South Korea's willingness to venture into economic cooperation, no matter the risk involved, because uh, some of these uh, big conglomerates have suffered some uh, uh, setbacks because of their... Uh, um, their dedicated support for economic cooperation with North Korea in the past. Right, but I think I think there, I think there's absolutely no um, uh, how should I say this uh, uh, wild-eyed expectation about what this particular visit is going to produce on the economic front. Um, I think the administration knows that there are sanctions in place. The business leaders understand, and so do the North Koreans. But this is a largely a symbolic gesture, as you've said earlier. Uh, where the business leaders are being sent to show Kim Jong-un and the leadership in North Korea of what's possible if North Korea takes meaningful steps on the nuclear front, if North Korea takes steps on denuclearization that's meaningful in a way that would work for the United States and President Trump to relax and lift um, uh, partially or wholly um, the existing sanctions in place, then you have these willing business partners who will um, take part in the cooperation um, uh, initiatives uh, to, uh, to, to make 
meaningful investments in North Korea. And I think this is, if, if you were to look at a parallel here, it's uh, when during the Singapore meeting, President Trump presented uh, Kim Jong-un uh, with his iPad a, a video uh, of what's possible uh, under uh, denuclearized North Korea and the Korean Peninsula. Um, and it was a video clip that he produced. And in, in, in some ways, this is, a, 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 this is President Moon Jae-in's video, but it's like not a video, it's version, actual, right? yeah, the real right. world version. He's not making this up, it, they're actual people um, who can actually Im make impact here. And he's brought all of them to North Korea. So it's a big statement from uh, President Moon to the leadership in North Korea and Pyongyang. All right, for North Korea, right now the stumbling block, the biggest stumbling block is, of course, sanctions at this point. It will open up doors in a number of ways. Uh, the, is the U.S. too fixated on sanctions and pressure? Uh, the, Donald Trump seems to believe that it's the only reason uh, that, that changed North Korea, uh, 180. Well, it's not just the economic sanction. If you look at the maximum pressure approach, it was the rhetoric plus a lot of the military posturing and the changes in military posturing uh, that not only threatened uh, North Korea, but uh, even the allies in the region, that's South Korea and Japan. Um, and clearly it rattled Beijing um, and Moscow as well. So um, it was, I think, a combination of different things here. And sanctions is uh, only a part of that equation. And it's one that the United States believes that it's not something that they could uh, relax at this point. Once they've let this uh, economic uh, uh, sanctions regime go, then they will never be able to put it back on. Um, as opposed to a military posturing, that's something, and the rhetoric as well. Um, I believe that President Trump thinks that those are things that can be switched um, um, you know, 180 degrees with the snap of a finger. If he wants to change military posturing, he could order um, the Indo-Pak command to um, change military posturing in the region. Uh, he can also up the rhetoric by simply tweeting a, a two or three a new tweet um, that can send a really big message and, and, and have a lot of people shaking at night here. Right, and uh, China is of course heavily criticized by President Trump for not doing enough. Um, how valid is the logic here? Um, I think that there's some truth to it. If we're taking a look at some of the trade data that, that's coming out um, again, but formally speaking, international sanctions still in place. Uh, Nikki Haley even came out and have said that uh, at the uh, UN Security Council that Russia is also not complying with the existing sanctions regime uh, with regards to North Korea. So there are two potential violators here. Um, that the U.S. is very concerned about. Um, but again, um, the pressure is on, as far as we know. Uh, uh, all the players internationally are coordinating on that front. And until North Korea changes and makes measurable, um, as takes measurable steps on the denuclearization front, I don't think the U.S. is going to let its, uh, pedal, uh, let its foot off the pedal on that issue. Right. Um, is it unrelated to Washington's frustration with Beijing over other particular matters? Yeah, I mean, clearly, trade is a very important issue here. And uh, North Korea is just one of those cards. And uh, at the moment, it's not as in your face. Uh, President Trump clearly focused on trade issues and bringing about a more balanced trade relations between, Be uh, between China and the United States. Uh, but uh, if uh, Beijing isn't cooperating on that front and he's not getting results, we may see some changes on other fronts, uh, namely North Korea and Taiwan. So uh, we'd have to wait and see whether or not he changes um, his position on these issues uh, because of trade-related matters. But for now, he's learned to separate the two and he's kept them different, uh, he's kept them separate. But w w again, uh, that can change and it's, it's difficult for me to say when and if uh, that will ha ever happen. Right, right now as we speak, we are seeing a footage of South Korean, North Korean delegation, uh, yes. the ministers meeting and shaking hands. On the right is Kim Myung-nam, the nominal head of state and the president of the presidium of the Supreme People's Assembly of North Korea. And shaking hand is the Culture Minister Tu Jong Hwan. Yes, uh, and she is the Minister of Land, Infrastructure and Transport, Kim Hyun Mi. And he is, the, uh, he is Kim Young Chun, Minister of Oceans and Fisheries. 
and he's Kim Jae-hyun, Minister of Forest Service. So uh, in this uh, special, th this group of special entourage were mainly uh, comprised of uh, government officials and ministers of the South Korean government, along with the, uh, I believe, the, uh, the political leaders. Right. Uh, poli yes. Initially, the political leaders, uh, they did not respond quite immediately, especially in the opposition bloc. And uh, thankfully, uh, a few more lawmakers were joining in uh, yes. this uh, trip up north. Yes. It, it would be better if uh, the opposition could have been a part of it. And of course, uh, interestingly, the finance minister was left behind for a good reason. Yes. Because he's uh, much needed. His services are much needed here in South Korea at this point. So the uh, North Korean official you see on the right, uh, Kim Young-nam, he's also a significant figure because he was the first to greet uh, the two South Korean presidents who came to North Korea for the summit in 2000 and 2007. He is one of the elders with a plenty of experience of seeing and witness a lot of uh, ups and downs yes. and changes along the way, which is the reason why President Moon Jae-in held a meeting with uh, senior officials with uh, just as much experience in inter-Korean affairs for their insights and, of course, to share his resolve in terms of what he's prepared for this summit. The number of uh, delegates this time was uh, slightly over 200, which is considerably smaller compared to previous uh, summits. There were close to 300 in the past. Is there a special reason why this was a more condensed version of previous uh, entourage or delegates that's joining the president? I think the president really wanted to focus on, on these issues that uh, really are important and pressing for him. Um, and that's denuclearization and also on confidence building measures. Um, and he doesn't want other things to distract this particular meeting. And having a large entourage with a lot of people and um, a lot of side events can take away from um, the, the main, main meeting. And so I think that this was a deliberate attempt to uh, put the focus back on the meeting and also for him to concentrate on these two issues that he came to deal with. And now, as I've said, denuclearization, very, very difficult. Uh, will he succeed? I'm not completely discounting the administration's ability to do this. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. But I think it's going to be very, very hard to get something out of that. Uh, but let's see what we get tomorrow. Right. It's going to be a very tedious process. We are curious to find out what uh, the Moon administration has prepared to try and uh, soften the tension that's building up between Pyongyang and Washington. Uh, Jiwon, we understand that this time despite uh, the fact that they tried to condense it down to a smaller group of people accompanying the president to North Korea, there were a number of very uh, high profile figures from the arts and culture scene as well and sports. Yes, uh, there were uh, a lot of, there are a lot of K-pop stars and idols that uh, joined the entourage this time as well. Uh, that includes a Lee, a female uh, pop famous singer in Korea and rapper Zico. And we also had a composer, uh, had composer Kim Young Sok join. Uh, he is one, uh, he composed a song that uh, wishes for the reunification of the two Koreas. And we also had some sports players coming in uh, to the north uh, this time as well. That includes uh, the former uh, leader, uh, the leader of the ice joint ice hockey team, Park Jong Hwa, who, uh, who managed to pull off great uh, at the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics earlier this year. As you can see on the footage right now, uh, it's Kim Young Nam is currently having a conversation with the uh, uh, Minister of Unification, Cho Myung Gyun. And uh, a while ago, there were also uh, other political figures, including uh, Park Ji Won, uh, who is a, a, a big political figure in South Korea's politics. And there were also a governor. There was also a governor of Gangwon-do Province, who is no stranger to North Korea and North Korean officials, as he was one of the busiest people when uh, North Korean officials and delegates came to Pyeongchang earlier this year. And we also had Seoul Mayor Park won soon greet the North Korean officials in the footage as well. Right. This is the uh, first time uh, for uh, South Korea's Foreign Minister Kang Kyung-wa to be crossing over to North Korea. There must be a, a certain degree of significance in her participation this time around. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, if we're going to get to um, a discussion, 
having to do with the end of war declaration or something that involves coordination with the United States. Her counterpart on the U.S. side is Mike Pompeo. Um, so she would be a critical uh, uh, player um, that stands in between um, North Korea and the United States. Um, and uh, it's someone that at the working level um, and the ministerial level, actually, that uh, um, President Moon and uh, North Korea can use uh, to try to uh, make a stronger case and, and be another sort of a, a mouthpiece um, advocating on behalf of North Korea and vice versa for her to also be able to play the messenger's role um, at post-summit. Uh, from for Mike Pompeo um, in North Korea. So uh, again, she hasn't really been um, as central up to this point, but um, if we see that she's going to play a more central role, uh, maybe we could hope for that um, in the coming days uh, post-summit. And so we'd have to wait and see how that works out. Right. We're seeing a number of uh, people shaking hands here as well. Chiwon, could you fill us in on the match, the, uh, the, the attendees at this point who is... So this group includes the religious figures right. uh, who joined the Centaurage as well. I think on the right is the priest. And uh, also the civilian organization uh, representatives also uh, were part of this Centaurage and part of this meeting. Uh, were there also labor groups involved from yes. South Korea as well? And they did have some active exchanges with North Korea holding a friendly soccer games. Uh, which also grabbed the spotlight as well. Yes, uh, there used to be some active uh, sports and cultural inter uh, uh, civilian exchanges between the labor unions between the two Koreas, but it's uh, it's it stopped as uh, it stopped as the two Koreas uh, had frosty relations for the past ten years. But it's recently resumed, and we are hoping to see more of those civilian exchanges between the two Koreas. Right, uh, those uh, lost years, some would call it. Uh, this is a very demanding time for the administration. Some would uh, criticize them for being too uh, friendly towards the North Korean uh, regime, that perhaps we should you know, take a more cautious approach. Uh, what's your take on that, Dr. Well, Kim? I mean, South Korea has, a, 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 this is a domestic political matter. You have folks that are um, obviously supporting the president's move on this front, and that's one half of the population. And there's the other half um, that uh, seems to be more opposed. Um, and we see them protesting in front of the embassy these days. Um, it's a smaller contingency, obviously. But um, again, uh, this is uh, what uh, we are supposed to see in a healthy democracy. Difference of opinion and ability of people to have these uh, difference of opinions, uh, whether um, you know, and and for people to be able to um, uh, vote on these issues and also to be able to speak out on these issues. Um, it's it's not surprising at all to me that uh, we have some groups that are supporting the president, some groups that are opposing it at all. Right. So far, the uh, destruction of facilities or uh, the gestures from North Korea, they haven't been. Uh, uh, received warmly from the U.S. Uh, because many experts know they have plenty more expendable facilities and equipments that they could uh, dismantle for show. So how much of a sincerity can be grabbed from North Korea's uh, recent gestures or how much more of this would be uh, uh, a valid uh, uh, message from North Korea to mm -hmm. the United States? I think, um, you know, we can't not downplay what North Korea has already done. We can't completely ignore that, okay? So these are steps. But the steps that would really matter and convince um, some of the skeptics um, in the Trump administration uh, and also um, uh, around the world would be a full accounting of all the fissile materials and all of the facilities in North Korea coupled with some kind of a verification regime or scheme where you would allow inspectors to have unfettered access into North Korea to do, you know, to check on, the, uh, on that list whether or not there is a full accounting of the WMD, uh, that the, uh, the nuclear materials that the North Koreans have suggested. And it doesn't only include the nuclear uh, weapons. There are other uh, WMD capabilities that uh, the world and the United States and South Korea we're all concerned about, and that's both biological and chemical weapons as well. So there are many, many things that North Korea can do to assure the international community about the seriousness on this front. 
and it would have to go beyond the steps that they have taken so far. And clearly, the case here is, the key word here is verification. Uh, would we be able to verify whether or not these facilities have in fact been destroyed? Would we be able to verify whether or not these facilities have actually closed? Um, and that requires an independent third party to go in and make some sort of an expert assessment about that, about these changes. It has to go beyond simply a press corps uh, and a press pool uh, with some videotapes uh, of, of uh, you know, explosions of some, some underground facilities. So it has to be more than what North Koreans have shown so far. What if the outcome of the summit is not up to expectations from the United States? What can we expect from then on in terms of the dynamics between North Korea and the United States and, of course, South Korea and the United States? Well, Sarah Huckabee Sanders has already stated that President Trump is willing to go on a second uh, summit with um, Kim Jong-un and that uh, already preparations are underway in the United States on that front. So we expect the second summit to happen um, regardless of um, the outcome at this particular summit. Uh, at least I'm hopeful in that regard. But um, North Korea clearly wants to show some um, uh, measurable progress here. Um, that uh, they have a willingness to move forward in a constructive way. If we go back and there's, no, there, there's actually no development on the denuclearization front, that's a really bad signal that they're sending ahead of the second summit with President Trump. Uh, and so um, whether uh, the second summit happens with, uh, between U.S. and North Korea, I think uh, we're more likely than not. But again, we've seen instances where President Trump has called that off at the last minute and brought it back on again. So um, um, it's very difficult to predict, uh, but at the moment, U.S. positioning, uh, posturing here on the diplomatic front is that they are willing to go ahead with the second summit. Um, and they expect positive results at this summit as well. Um, so uh, barring any surprises tomorrow, um, I think we're, go we're in a pretty good place at the moment. Right. Whatever outcome we have, it's going to be a catalyst to what was inevitable in terms of the summit between Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Right. Before we wrap things up, Ji-won, could you give us a brief recap of all that's uh, happened uh, since the summit was ongoing? Yes, uh, so there were a lot of uh, sideline meetings, including the ones with uh, the two uh, first ladies of the two Koreas who visited the Children's Hospital and the Pyongyang University of Dance and Music. And there was another meeting uh, between the business leaders and the vice premier of North Korea, as you can see on the footage right now. And there were, was the uh, uh, last there were also meetings between the uh, political leaders and government officials and Kim Young-nam, the nominal head of state and president of the Presidium of the Supreme People's Assembly of the North. And we also had the meeting between the civilian organization uh, representatives and the uh, religious figures and uh, with other North Korean officials as well.